Why are you living today? I mean, what's the purpose of your coming into existence? Have you any idea? Have you any notion of why you are living these years here on Earth? Why you're doing what you're doing now? Many of us tend to say, I haven't a notion. I haven't a clue why I'm here. If I could answer that, I would run the world. I don't see any sense in my being here at all. I have no idea why I'm here. And yet it is strange, isn't it, that you and I and probably thousands of other human beings should take that attitude towards a question like, why are we here? Because we don't take that attitude towards asking the question, why are you driving where you're driving at the moment? You would normally say, well, I'm driving this direction because I have to get home for dinner, that's why. Or I'm driving in this direction because I'm going to the theater. Or uh, I'm driving in this direction because I I'm going out to uh, play badminton or play billiards or something. But... Uh, you wouldn't dream of answering, I don't know why I'm driving where I'm driving tonight. I don't know. I, I'm just driving because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. In other words, in regard to ordinary everyday activities, we don't take such a irresponsible, easygoing, laissez-faire attitude towards the question why. And yet we do seem to take that attitude towards the cosmic question and obviously the much more important question, why are we here? And of course, probably some of the reason why we are a little casual about that question is because we have absorbed a great deal of the thinking that has gone around philosophically and scientifically and theologically and psychologically during these past years. And, of course, that thinking or that attitude seems to have indicated that there is no reason or sense to life at all and uh, that we don't really know why we're here. We're just here. We came into existence in a millisecond of uh, endless uh, time and uh, we're going to disappear in another millisecond and uh, we won't be noticed any longer and that's it. And yet it is difficult to imagine that it is all just as pointless as that, isn't it? It's a little difficult to think that it is as casual as that because there does seem to be great order and purpose in a lot of the things that we observe around us. It, it does surprise you that the seasons do come and go regularly, century after century. Sometimes, maybe in regard to Lords or Wimbledon, we're not sure that they are coming in the way they usually do, but still, despite the fact that uh, at times the weather is uh, a little bit of a disappointment, yet we do uh, expect spring uh, in certain months. We do expect summer in certain months, and we can depend upon them so reliably that we do successfully grow our crops on the basis of the orderly repetition of the seasons. It's the same indeed with our watches. We set our watches according to the orderly, regular orbiting of our Earth round the sun. And indeed, if we 
begin to think of our space shots, we depend utterly on getting our men into the right orbit. We depend utterly on the regular orbiting of the planets. And so there are many things in our own everyday lives that indicate that there is order and purpose in the general creation and that it would be very reasonable to expect that there is order and purpose in the creation of you and me. Because, of course, we are the very height of creation. Uh, we are the only... Our brain possesses the only cells that think about themselves. It's amazing. And they're the only cells that think about themselves. They're the only cells that can have the kind of discussion that you and I are having at this moment. They're the only cells that can reflect upon themselves and be self-critical. And uh, none of the animals can, none of the plants or the trees can. And despite that guy, you remember in the movie, that talked to the animals, the animals don't talk and they can't reflect and they can't analyze. And so we are not only part of an orderly creation, but we are actually the highest phenomenon in that orderly creation. So it's very reasonable to expect that there is reason for our existence and there is purpose for it. Of course, you and I have a tendency to say, well, maybe so, maybe so, and if there is, I certainly would like to know it, but I haven't a clue what that is, and I really don't know how to find out. And, of course, that's one of the problems. How do you find out why you're here? Uh, most of us try the vacation guidance counseling technique or we try to do multiphasic uh, tests or we try to do aptitude tests or we try to find out what our father and mother uh, had in their life that they've passed on to us and therefore uh, what we ought to do in the light of that. But despite those attempts at finding out what we should do in the way of a job here on earth, we still are bewildered as to the overall purpose of our being here. And, uh, of course, many people have tried to tell us uh, why we're here, but it's very difficult to respect uh, many of them. Many of them seem to be fanatics. They seem to be out for our money often, uh, or they seem to be out for their own egotistic reputations, or they seem to be sheer fanatics, uh, gurus and strange mystical types that are out to either make their financial fortunes or make their reputation or satisfy their uh, desire for fame. But we don't find many of them that we frankly can trust. And, of course, we said some months ago that there is one that stands above all the others. There is one who is very different. There is a man who is very different from all the religious teachers and prophets. And he is different because he not only taught the highest ethic and explained uh, most clearly what the purpose of life was and what reality was, but he lived it. He lived it in such a way that the people who actually brought about his death said uh, they could find no fault in him. And, of course, he was the only man who ever lived that kind of flawless life. Even people like Buddha and Muhammad uh, all admit uh, all kinds of flaws and faults that are obvious in their lives. This is the only man that uh, didn't do that and, in fact, had a life that reinforced his proclamation that he was doing the will of his father. And, of course, he explained that his father was really the creator of the world, the creator of the universe. The man, of course, was uh, one that we have long used as a swear word, and for a long time we've dismissed him as a kind of mystical uh, figure of the past who really didn't exist. But he did. He's uh, the most... Uh, historical figure, if you could uh, accept that term, uh, that uh, the world has ever seen, because his historicity is proven beyond all doubt. And he is, of course, Jesus of Nazareth. And that man, Jesus, who lived a life that was flawless, 
and was absolutely different from all the other religious leaders, uh, not only in his life but in his death, because he overcame death and he lived again, that man explained to us why we were here. And that's what I'd like to talk about tomorrow if you'd listen in. Thank you for listening.